So first we have to talk a little bit about perception. So why, right? Color is some physical property. Why, right? We, let's, let's start with the physics. So we have light. Light is broken into a spectrum. Uh, I'm sure this is review. You all remember this from the phys last physics class you took, right? There's an electromagnetic spectrum. It goes all the way from radio waves to gamma waves. Some little tiny fraction of this is visible light in the middle. This is what we're using. This is what's in our uh, computer graphics or realm of things that we're worried about. Um, within this, this portion of the spectrum, which is 400 to 700 nanometers roughly, uh, is the visible spectrum, different lights have different characteristics. So I'm showing this picture so that you can get, think about what's in a spectrum. So what does this mean? This means that at 400 nanometers, I have this much power. And at you know, 550 nanometers, this fluorescent lamp has a lot of power. Sunlight has a more even power. An incandescent lamp ramps up as we go towards red and infrared. Right? So different lights will have different things. LEDs tend to have a peak at a very narrow range. This is why they're power efficient, because they don't spread light all over the spectrum. If you want red, they just give you red only, as opposed to incandescent bulbs, which actually spread a lot of light out here in infrared, where we don't care. Right? So LED bulbs keep it in the visible range and so they're more power efficient. So this is what a physical spectrum of color light is. Uh, there's, of course, physical properties um, to this light. Right. So if I measure a blue light and a yellow light, and then I shine those two lights onto my measurement machine, they add up. It's linear. Right. So this was the power of one light. This was the power of the other light. You can think of it as physical photons flowing through space. Those photons just all add together, and I get some new power spectrum for, for what I'm going to see. So when we talk about measuring light, we're talking about in a narrow range, right? So you could say from 570 to 580 nanometers in this range, how many units of light did I measure in that range? And we could repeat, and in the limit, you get a continuous curve, right? So you can either talk about a vector of buckets, or you can talk about a continuous curve. So it's the same thing. And so we're talking about measuring how much light came in, the, in, this, in this bucket of, of the curve. So this is still physics. We're talking about physics. Now, now we come to the real question that we have to talk about when we're talking about color, which is, here's a physical property. What gets us to what do we see, right? I've drawn things that we will all identify as green, yellow, and red on this graph. But those are really constructs of the human mind. What's really there is this much power at 500 nanometers and this much power at 600 nanometers. That's the physics, right? And there's nothing special about this range that we see. We can talk about infrared or gamma rays. It's all part of the spectrum and how much power. That's physics. What do we care about as people? We, we care about that thing is green and the sky is blue. And this is the way we think about color. And so we need some mapping between these things. So we're going to talk about today some of how does the eye work and some of color spaces and some of the mapping in between. So let's switch and talk for a minute about the eye because we need to talk about how physics and the, the eye relate. OK, so you, you probably took a biology class at some point and you've probably seen pictures that look like this. We don't need to know the real details. We, there's a lens system up here, it's sort of like a camera lens. On the back is a sensor. Uh, your retina is kind of like a CMOS sensor, or rel relative, I guess, a CMOS sensor is supposed to act kind of like your retina. So your retina has a bunch of photoreceptors in it, and these photoreceptors measure light. So here's another drawing of the same thing. On this back surface of your eyeball, we have a bunch of cells. And some of these cells are rod cells, some of these cells are cone cells. The rod cells are monochromatic. The cone cells, uh, they're not colored red, green, blue. Um, they're LMS, but we'll, we'll see this in just a moment. And they look like this. Right, so here's cells. So these things are photoreceptors. When a photon comes in, they have some chance to react and produce a signal that goes off you. So they work sort of roughly like this. Photons come in. We have some detector. Um, and that detector could be either a silicon chip in a camera, or it could be this cone cell in the, in the back of your eye. And then this detector puts out some signal. So how much signal? Well, remember the incoming light is some wavelength, right? So we're, we're a function of a wavelength. And then we have some detection efficiency for this detector. And so this curve is the detection efficiency. So that says that at this wavelength, 
I'm going to see 100% of the photons. And over at this wavelength, let me pick here, maybe I'm only going to detect 10% of the photons. So you can think of it as a random counter. Um, if a photon comes in, do a random number cast, and 10% of the time we're going to detect it. So the total photons we detect is this times this. And then all of those photons, right? So this is the integral of those two things. Multiply the, the area. This is the amount of signal out. So in a camera, this signal out is a voltage. Um, in your brain, it's the rate of firing. So I, I think. Um, so rather than turning up the power of the firing, uh, basically the photon fires more frequently to the neurons behind it in the, in the brain. Um, but nevertheless, it's this total area which somehow is detecting how bright we, we see that at that signal. So these cones are spread around not evenly on our eyeball. Let me go back. Okay, so this back plane of our eyeball or this back plane of our eyeball um, in the fovea is a region which has much greater acuity, meaning that it has a lot more density of photons. And then as we get further away, we have less density of, um, of cells that can detect things. So it's mostly cone, uh, rods out here. The cones are mostly in the fovea. So here's the density spread angularly. So when we get to the fovea, we have a lot of cones. But then as we fall away, there's not many cones. And then in the periphery, we, we have a lot of rods. And what does this mean? It means we only have color vision in a very narrow spot of our eye. Well, that's not how I perceive the world. When I look around the world, I feel like I'm seeing color all over, right? I look outside my window, I look over here, I see color everywhere. What's going on? Our brain's playing a lot of tricks on us. The actual physical, what's happening is you only have color perception in a very narrow angular range, let's say five degrees on either side of this, uh, where you're gonna actually see color. Now your eyeball turns, so you rapidly sweep this around. And wherever you're not looking right now, your brain kind of remembers the colors it saw over there recently and makes stuff up for you. So the real measurement is happening only in this, this position. So let's talk about the cones, because we're trying to talk about color today. So, so rods are also interesting, but they're not part of the color perception. So we're going to talk about cones. There's three kinds of cones. There's S, M, and L cones. And they have spectral response curves that look like this. So the S cone, this, this is the blue end over here. This is the red end over here. So the S cone, you could think of it as blue, but this is short, medium, and long uh, wavelength sensitivity. So this blue curve is much less sensitive. That means at the equivalent power brightness, we are less sensitive to things that are in blue. The physical properties of the cones in our eyes are just less sensitive. And then, but these things all overlap. The green and the red, M and L, are pretty close to each other. They have similar spectral responses. So what does that mean? If I shine a laser, let's consider it. Let's say I shine a laser at 450 nanometers. Actually, all three are going to fire with roughly the same power. Versus if I shine a laser over here at 620 nanometers, I'm going to get essentially no S cones firing. And I'm going to get a little bit of M cones firing and then a lot more of L cones firing um, from the light that came at this nanometers, right? So most light that we see actually has a whole spectrum to it, but it's easy to think about lasers and how much response will we get. If we plot this as a 3D space, so here's our S, M, and L cones, and we shine lasers of different frequencies. So here's the whole visible range from 400 through 500, 600, up to 700 nanometers. This is how much power will be in this 3D space of S, M, and L cones. So you can, so it makes something called a spectral locus. So this is the laser light. Now, all colors, which are more complicated spectrums. So back here, we had a incident light had this spectrum. It wasn't just a single peak. It wasn't a single laser light. It had some spectrum. We would add together the responses for each of those things. And because those things add linearly, we can just draw lines in this space and then say, OK, we're going to interpolate partway between here and here because we had color values. And the color we're going to see is somewhere in the middle. So the response rate of the cones can lie anywhere within this spectral locus. But it can't lie outside because there's no light that could ever stimulate. There's nothing that can say stimulate just the M cone and get a point on this axis without stimulating the L and the S cones. Right? And we can see that here. There's no way to stimulate this M cone 
without at least doing something in S or L. It's not possible. That's not a response that we can see. It's a color we can't see, if you want to say it that way. There's nothing that can cause that to just happen. Um, there are research projects in the world where people are trying to figure out how to directly uh, shine light on the individual phones in AI to try to see what's happening. But a natural phenomenon, this is not something we can see. Here's what these cones look like on the back of the eye. So this is a little section of cones with false coloring on them. They don't really have this color, but it's false color so that we can see what the different cones are um, from 12 different individuals. And you can see these individuals have more um, of the green cones and these individuals have more of the red cones. All the individuals have relatively fewer blue cones. So it's not completely even between different people. It's not like the arrangement on the back of the eye is exactly equal. Um, so if you're wondering, do we all see the same thing? I guess probably not. Some people are more sensitive to some colors than our other people. So how does this work? Here's the cones on our eye. Um, so this is, this is a back plane of cones. And then we shine some image on it, on top of these cones. And then we go look at a single cone cell. So at this single cone cell, the image had some RGB value at that, at that cone cell. Well, in the real world, it had some spectrum. And then we have some spectral response curve. So this is the curve for the L cells. The red one here is an L. Um, and then so we take the integral of all this, and that's how much power is going to fire out of the back of, of this. And then if we go right here to this M cone, then it's the same spectrum coming in, um, or it might be different and because we're in a different special spatial region. And then we're going to multiply times this. And here's an S cone. So this is blue. And then this is going to take this spectrum from the world and then multiply times this response curve. And that's how much power is going to come out of here. So there's not just three colors going on here. There's three sensors going on. And they have some response to the whole physical um, stimulation that, that's occurring. These, these are them. So you can also talk about not just, I should say also, this idea that you're, you have different sensors on the back of your eye. One of the ramifications of this is you, at a given location, you don't see all of RGB in a single pixel, if you will. If, if you want to think of the cones as pixels on your eye, right? You only see one at a time in each place. And in fact, your camera works similarly. So your camera has RGB pixels. And it's similar to the way the human eye does and doesn't see all of the colors in each location. And you will see that, in fact, your display, even though we're setting color in every pixel, your display doesn't really have colors everywhere either. Your display is also spatially segmented like this. So this idea that things are next to each other as opposed to all in the same location, this is going to come up again and again in graphics. So we have a, this is a place where what we, talk about doing is not somehow the same as what's physically underlying. Physically underlying, these things are separated um, also on our displays when we come back and talk about displays. Um, but we talk about setting the, the pixel color. You could talk about, instead of individual curves for the three cones, you could talk about the overall brightness curve for the human. So if you shine laser light and you just ask the human, how bright do you see this thing? And you don't go physically measure. They, me they measure these things by taking, but the biologists go and they, they hook up, you know, you hook up your little electrodes to the back of those neurons and you find out how much power comes out of the back of them, right? So these things can be measured physically. This is, this is a perceptual quality. You ask people, how bright do you see this thing at, at different wavelengths? And it's somehow through your brain, some munging of all this stuff together. So we often call this brightness. brightness. So color imagery. So this question of color is really about how am I going to map this physical thing into some perceptual thing. So I've told you that the physicists and biologists know, know how to get these curves, right? We can, we can hook up tiny electrical probes and measure that stuff in the eye and figure out what's going on. But that somehow still doesn't give us the whole perceptual question uh, of what do we see. But it's getting us closer, right? So we know that humans get these three numbers. So there's a problem here. A spectrum is a function. It's got, it's not just one number or three numbers or 10 numbers, right? It's a whole function of, of response 
and your eye is only producing three numbers. And we're, so that means we're throwing away a lot of information. Our brain is missing all kinds of information about the colors that exist in the world. So what's the ramification of this? Well, ramification is it's possible to have two different spectra that produce the same SML values. And the word for this case is called metamer. So here's an example down here on the right. So this is a spectrum. This is a, from one of these little Java apps. So I just drew three, three spectrums. So here I drew some spikes at three places. Here's the three values your eye produces, and here's the color that we see from that. So here's a different spectrum, not the same spectrum. Produces the same three values and therefore the same colors. So this comes up over and over. And this problem is why your camera has a color correction feature. Right? So if you ever used a camera where you had to set a setting that says I'm under fluorescent light or I'm under sunlight, I'm under some other kind of lighting because this kind of issue of metamers. And if you ever bought light bulbs that have a CRI value, color rendering index, it also has because of this kind of problem. Because, oh, I thought I liked the color of this blue paint when I looked at it in the fluorescent lights in the paint store. But I came home and I painted my house with it, and now it's under sunlight, and it doesn't look like the same color anymore. Why? Because of this concept of metamers and what are you, and what are you getting? getting out. So sometimes things can look the same, but they really have different underlying spectrums. So you change the lighting that's on them, and then you, and then you get something different coming out.